See, when I think of crypto, I'm thinking industrial revolution. I'm thinking printing press. I'm thinking moon landing. I'm thinking major innovation. Like the world's gonna be changed. Like when the internet was created that big of a difference times 10, that's the level I'm on when I'm thinking about cryptocurrency. Because once you start dissecting it and researching it, once you start actually looking into what it is for real and what industry it disrupt, you start to realize that you're not talking about a crypto asset anymore. You're talking about literal mechanisms, a meta mechanism under the foundation of human coherence. This is the mechanism that will allow humans to communicate all forms of value, verbal value, monetary value, fun value, every value that you could possibly have on a digital device will be transmitted through a cryptocurrency. And this is what blows my mind that there's so many people out there that still don't understand the value of this entire asset class and how small it is in comparison to how big it's going to be in the future. It's guaranteed at this point. There's so much credibility in this market. It's absolutely ridiculous. We have Elon Musk. We have Jack Dorsey, the biggest institutions, BlackRock, billions and trillions of dollars are pointed at the crypto industry. It's not a scam. I remember when I first got in, people thought it was a scam. It's not a scam anymore. And if anybody's saying that, it's because they just genuinely don't know. We're so early. We're at a point where it's like, you could still make crazy amounts of money. The innovation's making the market expand even bigger. There's projections people have had in the past. And, and when they look at Bitcoin and the price of crypto, they're looking at Bitcoin and the price of crypto and they're like, oh, well, it's the diminishing returns. It's getting less and less profitable. It actually is not getting less and less profitable. If you look at the last video I made, this is a video series, by the way, if you're new to this channel, my name is Alex to talk about crypto. And of course, I try to keep it as down to earth as possible and give you guys as much research as possible. But if you look at my last video, I basically gave you the answer that no, it's not becoming less lucrative. If you buy Bitcoin and Ethereum, yeah, that's less lucrative. But if you're buying the altcoins, like the altcoin we're gonna be talking about in this video becomes more lucrative because there's more innovations that we couldn't even conceive being put into crypto that are coming out of crypto. There's innovations that we couldn't even comprehend in our brain. That is what you call true futurism to where a mechanic is built that we didn't have before that's creating more things that we didn't have before that and the things that we made that we didn't have before are beating the things that we have now by a long shot it's way better it's cheaper it's more efficient in every variable imaginable if you dissect the mechanics behind a cryptocurrency assets the, the ones that work, the ones that are good, the ones that are well-researched, you'll start to realize that there's nothing that slightly compares to it. In a form of making money on the internet, in a form of starting a business, there's nothing that compares to it. In the first video of the series, I showed you guys a scientific peer-reviewed paper with extreme credibility that shows you that the first mover advantage, it's extremely lucrative. Most of the big monopolies that you guys know of today's day and age, like the big car companies or whatever the case is, most of them have a first mover advantage, a massive first mover advantage. And you watching this video right now are the select few. I showed you in my first video in the series that cryptocurrency is only 1% of the total stock market. Imagine the world's finance is not even 1%. We're not even 1% there yet. We're not even 1% there yet. And the technology behind this is guaranteed. I'm going to say that with all of the credibility in my entire existence, crypto is guaranteed to be the future infrastructure and financial asset class of the entire world. All value will be transferred on the cryptocurrency blockchains that are selected at the time. In 50 years from now, we wouldn't know what an internet is. We're gonna know what Web3 is. We're gonna know what the infrastructure of crypto is. That's what it's gonna be. I don't know what it's gonna be called, but that's what we're gonna know. Our kids are not gonna know what Web 2.0 was. Just like some of them don't even know what dial up is and that noise is when you, you know, I know you guys know what I'm talking about when the internet started up back in the day, like, bah, bah, bah. yeah, you know what I'm talking about. 
There's a lot of kids that don't know what that is. There's a lot of them that don't know what that is. And today, I want to talk about one of those infrastructures. This is a video series if you're new here. My name is Alex. I talk about cryptocurrency and I'm making a crypto series. I've been in this market for eight years. I've taught thousands of people, seven figure earners, eight figure earners, and I've reached millions of people with cryptocurrency. And in this video series, I'm dissecting 100X altcoin. Let me say it again, 100X. That's equivalent from turning $100 into $10,000 as well as turning $1,000 into $100,000. These are absurd returns, and I proved it in the last videos that you can do 100x, and I'm building up to it. So I have a strategy, as you can see here, smart, seek the market trend. The last two videos, we essentially obliterated the first part, seeking the market trend. Why? Because I made a monumental investment into cryptocurrency. I put 50% of my entire net worth, everything, into cryptocurrency. And if you want to get access to the 100x altcoin, you will see it at the end. So once we get to the bottom half of this. So I would say in maybe one, two, maybe three more videos, we're actually gonna get into the altcoin because I have to make the basis, the argument basis up into the altcoin, I'm professional. Uh, when someone says some altcoin, top five altcoin on video on the internet, they're giving you baby stuff. I don't know about you guys, but I, you're not babies to me. You're not babies, you're, they're giving you the baby stuff. They're just giving you the altcoin. They're not giving you any reason behind it. They're not giving you a reason why the trend is going in this way. Is it bullish, is it bearish? I want to give you everything, an entire research thesis. This is why the videos are so long. It's 250 slides. It's a monumental report that I put together just to buy one altcoin. Just to buy one altcoin, I put a monumental 250 slide report. If you want to get access to this altcoin, to the report, to everything I've already done, what altcoin I invested in with 50% of my net worth, Head on over to coinpicksinnercircle.com. This is my trading group. This video is sponsored by it. It's by me. I sponsored my own self <laughs> with Coinpix Inner Circle. That's where you already got the altcoin. You get all of my buy and sell calls. You get all of my research. You get my research methods. You get pretty much all of the information before I put it on YouTube, far before. I've been talking about some of this information months ago. And you get a community of seven and eight figure earners as well as 480 testimonials. CoinPix Inner Circle is basically an answer to someone that wants to learn crypto as quickly as possible. And you pay a price so that you can learn quicker and not have to go through the same things I went through in the past eight years of crypto. It's as simple as that. It's a simple thing. You learn how to do it. You ask me questions. I give you answers. And then I give you everything I do on the back end as an expert cryptocurrency investor. Trader. I, can, I say trader because it's called a position trade. Position trades are your trades. Investing is like 10 years. So I can't call myself... A crypto investor. I'm more of a crypto trader, if that makes sense. So in this video, I want to go over essentially the infrastructure that the coin is going to be on. So I have to give an explanation before we dive into it. Okay. I have to give an explanation of exactly how this is going to play out. So you understand the contents of this video and how it's going to work. Okay. So essentially cryptos have layers to them. This, this technology behind it, it's called cryptographic technology and blockchain technology, distributed ledger technology. Distributed ledger and blockchain are similar, not the same. They all have their little differences. Cryptographic technology is an is a actual deep, it's a puzzle. So, so essentially, for cryptographic technology, they have created a code. Someone, Satoshi Nakamoto, okay, which is the inventor of Bitcoin, he created code that can secure a monetary system unlike we've ever had before without a third party intermediary. So right now in every single asset class, there's always a third party intermediary. So for example, let's say you buy a shirt from a store and you have a problem with the shirt and you try to return the shirt, they won't accept your return. Where do you go? You go to the bank and you say, hey, they messed up my thing. That's a third party intermediary. So in every system on earth, there's a third party. The problem with that is that if you get to high levels with lots of money, there's a lot of collusion and corruption. So for example, you can pay somebody off to get benefits. You could pay off the third party intermediary, right? And there's just all types of problems with centralized organizations. Centralized organizations, there's all types of problems. So cryptocurrency solved that, okay? But the thing is, is that there, each cryptocurrency, even though they solved the the actual decentralization of systems they solve decentralization system they're not all perfect and they have their own pros and cons so essentially they stack on top of each other 
And this is where we call, this is what we call the multiverse, the cryptocurrency multiverse. It gets deep. It gets really deep. And the prime multiverse or the layer one, the, the bottom layer, okay? The one that you don't really see, you're probably not going to use that much in the future. You know, it's crazy for me to say this because I use it all the time. It was like, it was like the interface. So interface basically means when you open up your phone, right? You open up your phone and you open up an app. You open up an app like this is my music app, right? That's the interface, but there's code behind it that you don't see, right? So to me, Ethereum is like that code. It's unseen, like you see it now. Some people might actually still use it, but I believe in the future, it's gonna be the code under the main interface. So the main interface of the future, I believe right now, the winner is Arbitrium. So it's essentially Ethereum's at the bottom. Then there's a code stacked on top to where people that are basic, that don't understand crypto that much will likely use. It's the interface. And that interface on top is Arbitrium. Ethereum is considered a layer one protocol and Arbitrium, Arbitrum, I don't even know how to pronounce it. I call it Arbitrium because that's what, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Leave a comment below. What is it? Arbitrium, Arbitrum? I don't know. What's the, what's the answer? But Arbitrum stacks on top. It's considered a layer two. So it's a layer two. And it's the beauty of it is that it's fast, it's cheap and easy to use. Fast, cheap, easy to use. Ethereum, it's pretty easy to use. It's like the same, but it's not fast and cheap. It's, it's slow and very expensive. So that means the normal person is not spending $7 for a transaction fee. And that's what I've been spending for so long. In some cases, the transaction fee is 50 bucks, 100 bucks. Nobody's going to do that. On Arbitrum, it's a penny, two pennies to move your money, right? So you can see when it comes to normal person user interface, this makes sense, right? So we have layer one, layer two Arbitrum. Now on, on Arbitrum, there's other coins and other apps. And this is where the 100X altcoin is going to come from. I talked about this in multiple videos. That's where the 100X is. It's going to be on Arbitrum. The 100X altcoin is going to come from there. But before I even jump into the 100X altcoin, I am going to make a case that Arbitrum is the winner. I'm not going to just say empty promises on the internet, okay? I'm not going to just, oh, it won because I like it in these three reasons in this five-minute video. No, I'm going to show you undeniable proof unlike any proof you've ever seen on the internet. And if it switches, it switches, and I'll show you undeniable proof about another coin in the future, but I highly doubt it. Arbitrum has been taking over the internet, and specifically taking over cryptocurrency when it comes to liquidity. And I'm gonna show you that I believe it's the winner. And then once I establish that, it's the winner. Look at this chart here. So seek the market trend. I established the market trend. I made a case for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and why it's the best. And then I showed you that it's going up, it's bullish right? At least in the near term. I, I said it's going to be bullish. And I even showed you, if you watch my other videos in the series, I actually showed you the exact indicator of when it's going to fall too. So I believe it's going up and it's the greatest asset class to invest in the world when it comes to your time. Now, what I'm going to do, I look at the trend and this is, this is the beauty of this, this right here, this mechanism, this smart mechanism, this actual strategy I put together. You can remember it, seek the market trend, monitor liquidity, altcoin fundamental analysis, risk management, and attract the trade. The beauty of this is that you can use it for anything. So when I look at the actual overall trend and I believe the market's going up, then I go to the liquidity. I look for the liquidity. Now, just to give you a simple breakdown of liquidity, I want you to think of a pond, right? Think of a pond, right? Let's say we have a pond and we have a big fish trying to swim in the pond. It's not going to, it's not going to be that easy if it's a small pond, right? But if you have a big pond with a whole bunch of liquidity, right? A whole bunch of, a whole bunch of water, it's going to be easier for bigger fish. It's similar to investing in crypto. So when you have a protocol with very little liquidity, it's hard for bigger whales to buy in. It's very difficult for big, big whales or people with a lot of money. A whale is a, is a person with a lot of money to buy into the protocol, right? So you want to find, this is, this is the answer here. You want to find protocols with a little bit of liquidity, not too little, but like a good amount that is going to have a lot of liquidity in the future. And this is where you get the price increase. And liquidity just means how much money is in the protocol. Just, just swap out from the, the you know, example I gave you, money with water, water with money. So protocol needs to have a good pond of liquidity, a nice structured base. And when it does, it opens up the gate for other, okay, um, you know, big 
more liquidity, right? More liquidity wants to come in, which increases that pond and makes it bigger and bigger and bigger. And then it, it just, that's where the price increase comes from. That's where all the price increase comes from. So liquidity is one of the most important variables. So with that being said, there's a lot of other layer ones and layer twos that you'll see on the market as competitors, but they don't have liquidity. And for the purposes of this video, I don't want a coin that actually has too small liquidity. I actually want one that's bigger. Why? Because I'm not going to buy Arbitrum, or if I do, I'll buy very little. I want Arbitrum to have a lot of liquidity off the bat because the coin I'm buying is in Arbitrum. So if Arbitrum doesn't have enough liquidity, then the coin that's in Arbitrum doesn't have a chance to increase in liquidity because there's no, where is it going to come from? Does that make sense? Let me explain it one more time because this can get very complex. This can get, and there's no image or video I can give you on this. I just have to explain it verbally and you have to rewatch the video if you don't understand it. But I'm going to say it again. That's going to be, I'm just, I'm just going to say it again. I actually want Arbitrum to have a lot of liquidity. For price increase for me to make money, you want to find a protocol that's a little bit that gets big. That's what you want. But for the purposes, I, remember, I'm not buying Arbitrum. I'm just simply using it as a protocol to buy my coin. So it's essentially, I'm analyzing the protocol not for price increase. I'm analyzing it for the coin I'm going to buy. That being said, I wanted to start with a lot of liquidity. So when, I, I'm, when I'm looking at the crypto market and you can do this, I go to Binance Smart Chain, uh, not that much liquidity. I go to, uh, I don't know, this altcoin, uh, not that much liquidity. I'm not going to... I'm not going to use their layer two or their layer one because there's no liquidity. If there's no liquidity, there's no infrastructure. There's no developers. There's no marketing. The money makes all of it go. Money makes, so you need money in it for the altcoins to actually do well. Very, very important. Very important to understand, guys. Extremely important to understand this. So I want to find a protocol that has a lot of liquidity and has altcoins on it that will do well. And spoiler alert, that is Arbitrum. So let's jump into Arbitrum. We're going to go into the macro liquidity. And that macro, we have macro and micro. We'll talk about the differences. You can see there's macro liquidity. We'll talk about the differences, okay? So I actually have a system to analyze this, and it's called DEEP, okay? How to analyze liquidity. So we have the decentralized pool liquidity. The size of the liquidity pools on decentralized exchanges like Uniswap or SushiSwap indicates the ease of trading a particular asset without causing major price changes. So that's a good way to put it because essentially the reason why liquidity is important is because if, if there's only a million dollars of liquidity and I have $10 million as a whale, if I buy it, I will 10x the price as I buy it. So I'll literally get less and less coins as I'm buying it myself. Very important, right? So the size of the liquidity pools are pretty important. You don't want it to be too big in the purpose of buying things. Like if you want to like get rich, like you want to buy altcoin that has low liquidity, has because you want the price to increase, right? But you don't want it to be too small. You want a nice size, which we'll talk about that, right? Now, let's go into uh, everything broken down. So if we actually go to Arbitrum and we go to, uh, this is actually on Uniswap. So Uniswap, and I'm going to show you guys really quickly a feature on Uniswap. Uniswap allows you to look at all the liquidity pools on a decentralized exchange. So this is the beauty of, let me pull it up real quick. This is the beauty of actual cryptocurrency. So you actually can't do this analysis in um, stock trading or web 2.0. Essentially, if you did that, it would be like allowing you to go into their books like and see into their financial history. You can't do that. But with cryptocurrency, everything is open and transparent on a, on a distributed ledger. That's the technology behind it. So I can go here, right here, to more view more analytics, right there. And then I can go into any coin, right? And let, let, let's go into Arbitrum, because that's what I'm doing. So Arbitrum, boom. Now remember, we're using, this is the layer one Ethereum, right? So look at the layer one Ethereum. TVL, total value locked, 947K. That's not a lot. It's not a lot at all. But I wasn't looking at that. I was looking at Arbitrium, the Arbitrium coin on the Arbitrium chain. This might be a lot for new people. If you're, if you're new and, and you just don't understand this stuff and it's getting difficult for you, again, I highly recommend you join CoinPix Inner Circle. Join CoinPix Inner Circle. We have a Signals platform at all as well. It's cheaper, but you don't get any videos. I recommend you join CoinPix Inner Circle if you're trying to take this serious or continue watching the videos. If you continue watching the videos, you will catch on. 
So as you can see, our 1.05 or 1.5 billion dollars worth of liquidity. That's a lot of liquidity. So all of this liquidity has a chance to go into the altcoin that I bought, right? Which you can find in CoinFix Inner Circle. So that that's just like a little tutorial for you guys on where I got these numbers from. It actually increased. That's funny. Or yeah, this is 34 million. It actually increased from the, from the last time we looked at it. So we have our liquidity on our Beatrim, right? Let's go down. Now, if we look at this, this is ARB liquidity on Ethereum. You can see it decreased a little bit. So there's money coming off uh, Ethereum and going into our Beatrim. Now, that really shows me that we have enough liquidity. So that kind of checks off the box. But you could take it a little bit further. You could actually look on CoinGecko. So if you go to CoinGecko, they have a tab, and I'm going to show you guys that as well. If you go to CoinGecko, you can go to CoinGecko or CoinMarketCap. I think CoinMarketCap is better. CoinMarketCap.com. And you go to ARB right? Or Btrim right here. You scroll down, you see markets, right? They have a little tab where you can do centralized exchange and decentralized exchange. You can see all of them right there. There you go. You see all of them right there. That's essentially where I got these screenshots from. I want to I show you where I got it so you guys can learn for real. Now that kind of checks off my box. There's good liquidity there. Now let's go into exchange availability. The number of exchanges in which the cryptocurrency is listed on, all right? And it affects its liquidity, right? The more exchanges it has, the more availability it is for all people all over the world, right? Um, so let's look into that. So as you can see there, it's pretty much on every big exchange that you know of in crypto. It's one of the most top adopted cryptocurrencies on the market. It's on the biggest exchanges for sure. That checks the box hundred percent. And you can look at that again, uh, same website, just go to CoinGecko, go to markets, and then you can go to all, and you'll see that there it's, it's on Binance, Coinbase, KuCoin. These are the biggest exchanges in the cryptocurrency market. So checks that box off for me for sure. Exchange volume. So this is the total amount of cryptocurrency bought and sold on exchanges. High trading volume is generally a sign of high liquidity. So that basically means how many times is it exchanging back and forth? What's the volume? Now you could look at multiple places. As you can see here, they have high volume. We're looking at 224 million on Uniswap. I mean, this is the decentralized exchange volume. Look at the centralized exchange volume. So this is a couple days ago when I made this presentation, but it's still high, 61 million, 4 million. These are crazy numbers. These are like big numbers. Let's look at it now uh, today. So as you can see, the volume is 24 million. So these are big numbers. You're not going to really see that on a bad altcoin. If it's a bad altcoin, and if it's, if it's unsafe and doesn't have liquidity, you're not going to see that. Now let's look into protocol TVL or total value locked in decentralized finance. So TVL is the total amount of assets currently staked or locked in a protocol. High TVL can signify trust, utility, indirectly contributing to overall liquidity. So this is the amount of money that's like locked in the entire protocol, not just in a token, but the entire protocol. And as you can see here, all of cryptocurrency layer twos, these are layer twos, has 10 billion at the top right hand corner. But right here at the bottom, they have 5.97 billion on our Betrium one. Now I wanna look at it really quickly today because it might've changed briefly. But again, this is just analyzing it just to understand that the, it's not a scam, essentially. So as you can see here, 5.32 billion TVL. So it's accurate. They have a lot of TVL or total value locked in the mechanism. So I could say from every single perspective, they have a lot of liquidity. Our Btrim has a lot of liquidity. It actually is number one. So if we go back up to this other website, when it comes to layer twos, these are all the layer twos that they have. It's number one is number one and it's doubling number two. So it's number one by far and uh, there's no other competition. So they're the best layer two on the market right now when it comes to liquidity, which to me is the most important variable. All right, so we got liquidity dump. Now let's go into altcoin fundamental analysis. Let's actually dissect the altcoin and look at it from a fundamental analysis perspective to make sure that the altcoin price goes up so that the coin that we buy on Arbitrium goes up too because typically that's how it works. Layer twos, being that it has an altcoin under it, it's like a it's like an operating system and it has altcoins and apps on top of it. They're typically the altcoins on our Betrium are subject to the altcoins it's created on. And if the altcoins that it's created on does well, then that altcoin would do well as well. Hopefully that makes sense. So if our Betrium does well, the altcoin 100x altcoin I picked should do well. So I have to do altcoin fundamental analysis. And that's what I did. Um, and I have an entire system for this as well. As you notice, this is professionalism. This is having a good strategy. A lot of people just buy cryptos for no reason. 
This is what Sirius looks like. So for altcoins specifically, I have a system. It's called Masters. You analyze the micro liquidity. So you see what I'm doing. I'm going from the top to the bottom. We're looking at the entire trend of the entire market. Then we're going into the, where the liquidity is going. And then we're going to even micro liquidity. And then we're going to even dive deeper into liquidity. You'll see what I'm saying. So we go into the micro liquidity. We analyze the use case, study the tokenomics, track the team, evaluate the marketing, look at the regulatory environment, and search the news. So very, very deep here. We're diving very deep. So let's look at the micro liquidity. So pretty much same thing. Good volume, as you can see right there. Very good volume. Now, this is actually, I'm glad I put this here. This is actually a breakdown of the layer twos and layer ones. So they have a token bridge. So I took it even a step further just to make sure I wanted to make sure there was liquidity on the token bridge. Because remember, I told you it, the layer two stacks on top of the layer one. So as you can see there, there's an actual bridge to get your money from layer one to layer two. I will be making a tutorial maybe after this one, after making this video on how to bridge your assets over to Arbitrium. So you buy your assets on Coinbase, for example, you send it over to Ethereum, you bridge it over to Arbitrium, then you buy what you need to buy. That's how I essentially do it. And the token bridge has a certain amount of liquidity too. If the token bridge has no liquidity, then no assets can be purchased on Arbitrium. Like no assets can come over. Like they can't get any new people. So we need to make sure that that bridge is on point. And I looked at it. They have a lot. They have a, a lot of transactions, a lot of active address, addresses, uh, the bridge activity. I mean, we're talking about a lot of money here. That's 2.9 billion. Uh, on Ethereum, but look at Arbitrium, uh, 81 million. That's enough. That's a lot. Remember, we're looking at only the bridge right now. Okay. So I, I wanted to look at that as well. And we have Stargate here showing the overall of all of their bridge liquidity, which is 587 million. These are good numbers. These are numbers that are doable. Now let's look even deeper into the micro liquidity. So on Arbitrium specifically, so on the Arbitrium chain, <laughs> this is complex stuff, but on the actual Arbitrium chain, we see that we actually have good volume, okay? And that's that's on Ethereum, but look at Arbitrium. Uniswap version three, Arbitrium, we have $12 million worth of volume. That's really good volume. Now, I wanna compare it, so you see on the decentralized exchanges, the difference. If we look at Uniswap, so if you're watching this video, chances are, if you've gotten this far, you, you're, you're, you're with me on a lot of this stuff, okay? so. Essentially, I'm establishing where the liquidity actually is. So we got the big overarching picture. I showed you guys overarching that the liquidity is in this general direction. Now I want to establish where is it actually in the cryptocurrency market. And what we're looking at here is Uniswap. Uniswap has most of, it usually has it most of the time. Look at the difference though. TVL, ETH and Arbitrum. 18.7 million. Look at the top token. Look at it. Look at Arbitrium on Camelot, which is on the Arbitrium chain too. Only three, 3.6 million. There's a, that's a monumental difference. So if I'm buying Arbitrium, I'd buy it on Uniswap. That's where I'm buying it. If I'm buying Arbitrium, I'm buying it on Uniswap, not Camelot, because there could be a price impact. Now let's analyze the use case because we found the micro liquidity. Let's analyze the use case. Use case is important because it really tells us how the coin is being utilized for number one, the price increase in the value of the coin, but number two, how they're taking coins off the market. Very, very important. So Arbitrium, I'm gonna put it simple. You guys can read this for yourself and get the full thing in CoinPix Center Circle, but I wanna keep it simple. Essentially Arbitrium is a layer that stacks on top of Ethereum. It's compression technology. So it allows lower cost and higher throughput, meaning faster transaction speeds. It's literally seconds and it costs pennies instead of Ethereum, which is costing dollars, in some cases $20, $30, and can take up to a couple minutes, even to an hour, depending on the actual congestion of the network. So this allows it to be fast and cheap, but it keeps similar security features that Ethereum has. There's other layer ones that compete with Ethereum by just creating an entire new chain. Arbitrium plans to connect to Ethereum. That's, in my personal opinion, way better. So as you can see here, benefits of Arbitrium. Ethereum-like security with a thousand X improvement 
and throughput and lower fees, reduces storage bloat and eases full node requirements for Ethereum. This is the most important part is that it allows everything on Ethereum to operate the way it's supposed to operate. Because like I said previously in the video and in other videos, I believe Ethereum is the winner. Interoperability allows smooth interchange between Ethereum and Arbitrum through the bridge that we talked about. It's smooth, it's easy, and it's a path to greater scalability as hardware and software improve over time. So this is essentially a tapping into what I said previously, right? Why not just adopt another layer one? Well, it's because people are familiar with Ethereum. Building on Ethereum allows Arbitrum to leverage all existing knowledge, tools, and application in Ethereum's ecosystem. Users and developers don't have to learn a completely new platform. And this is important because developers, okay, developers specifically, don't have to learn a whole new coding language. Yeah, we might have a user be able to learn Ethereum in, in a couple of weeks, maybe a month, but developers will spend years learning a completely new, new language just to code on Arbitrum if it wasn't the same as Ethereum. Also, I wanna talk about this new news that just came out. Arbitrum actually came out with Arbitrum Stylus or Arbitrum Stylus, sorry guys, I suck at pronouncing it. Will make it easy to write smart contracts using computer languages compatible with WebAssembly WASM standard seen as far more common than Ethereum virtual machine or EVM standard that many blockchain developers currently use. So in the actual cryptocurrency community, in the crypto community, the standard is Solidity, which is created by Ethereum. It's the Ethereum coding language. They just launched this. This is August, August 31st. So this is brand new news. Arbitrum not only made it for Ethereum developers to come on over, they're making it easy for every developer to come on over now. They just dropped Arbitrum Stylus, which makes it so much easier for the common developer that's never been in blockchain before to use Arbitrum. That's crazy. That's insane. The offering now available for use on a testnet means developers can program with popular coding language like Rust, C, C++ alongside languages that are compatible with Ethereum virtual machine or the EVM standard, which is far more common among today's crypto developers. So they're just making it super easy for developers all over, which if you know, that's extremely important because this is how the ecosystems are gonna actually be built out. This is a big move, a big move that not too many people are talking about. So this is another reason why it's not smart, in my opinion, to adopt another layer one, just use Ethereum, because Arbitrum is just making it super easy for people to adopt Ethereum on multiple levels. Interoperability, apps on Arbitrum can easily interoperate with Ethereum's mainnet. Assets and contracts can move between the two. A standalone layer one suffers from fragmentation. Security, this is another big one. Remember, Arbitrum is compression technology. It's cr compression technology for Ethereum. So it just attaches onto Ethereum. Leveraging Ethereum's consensus mechanism gives Arbitrum battle-tested security. New layer ones have more unproven security assumptions. So Ethereum has survived pretty much everything. Every attack there could possibly be, they've survived it. It's the longest smart contract platform blockchain wise. So they have the best security for sure. Network effects. We talked about network effects in previous videos. Ethereum has far larger user base, developer community and ecosystem. It taps into it. Arbitrum taps into it rather than starting from zero users. Decentralization. You get all the decentralization benefits from Ethereum. You get the point. Liquidity. You get all the liquidity benefits from Ethereum. Reduce risk. This makes it so much easier for Arbitrum to grow because of these huge benefits that they get. Instead of trying to fight Ethereum, they joined Ethereum. And here's uh, some more benefits that you guys can look into. Here's the actual technology. I'm not going to go too far into it, but basically they do off-chain execution and then they run it back through Ethereum through a series of checks. Now at the bottom, that's what I do want to talk about is the Arbitrium token, which provides incentives via manager staking deposits that get slashed if they lie. That's one thing I want to talk about because Basically, let's say hypothetically, somebody sends $100 to another person and there's something called a manager. A manager will look at it and, and determine is that actual transaction real or are they faking it? And they could have managers that would dispute a certain transaction. If the manager's lying, they actually get their staking deposits slashed. 
and it gives the reward to the one that wasn't lying. So it's essentially a, 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 a court case. It's like taking someone to court and then the winner wins money if they're actually correct and not lying. So they have managers that get paid off of that, right? Um, and they also have verifiers earn portions of slash deposits to compensate them for their dispute resolution. So this is something that's taking more Arbitrum off the market and making it you know, basically uh, more scarce as well as providing security for the overall ecosystem. Now, here's what it looks like. Layer one versus layer two. It st stacks on top. We explain this verbally, but we do have actual pictures here. So again, layer two refers to a secondary framework or protocol that's built on top of the existing blockchain. The goal of the layer two solution is to increase the transaction capacity of the blockchain and reduce fees while maintaining the same level of security. So it stacks on top. Now, for my favorite part, this is one of the most important parts of an altcoin because it really shows us how the price is going to increase. Now, we have an entire system for this as well, an entire system for this, guys. So if you haven't noticed the professionalism, I just want to really tap into that and really show you guys that every variable is looked at when it comes to a cryptocurrency. We have the entire system. It's a checklist. We could just go through the checklist and really just figure out if the coin is, is finessing you or not. It's as simple as that. A lot of these coins will finesse these variables. So you can see it right in its face. Is it a good coin or not, right? So total supply, circulating supply. Total supply is basically the maximum amount of tokens. Circulating supply. This refers to the number of tokens that are actually circulating or available for trading or selling on the open market. Token distributions. How are the actual tokens allocated at launch? We're going to look at the distribution plan and how much is being given to the developers, investors, advisors, or reserved for marketing and business development. Inflation rate. Some tokens don't have a total supply. So an inflation rate will be how much inflation is it getting per year? Kind of like the United States dollar doesn't have a total supply. We don't know what the total supply is. They don't tell us because they don't ever have a to total supply. They just keep printing, right? Burn rate. Some cryptocurrencies implement a mechanism where tokens are actually destroyed or burned. Utility. What is the function of the token in the ecosystem? How is it actually being used? Consensus mechanism. The consensus mechanism is either proof of work, proof of stake, delegated proof of stake. It's usually proof of work or proof of stake. 99% of the time, it's like proof of stake nowadays. But it's good to have this in there so you can see if there's a different consensus mechanism. Decentralization. How decentralized are the coins or the project? If a single entity or small group of entities holds a large portion of the tokens, this could pose risk in the form of centralization and manipulation. Lockup periods. These are periods when the tokens cannot be sold or transferred. The presence of a lockup period for early investors or founders can be a positive sign of long-term commitment. Vesting schedule. It's the time set by a project during which the tokens are slowly released to team members or investors. This could provide assurance that there won't be a sudden sell-off. Emission schedule. The rate of which the new tokens are created and how they're distributed could have a significant effect on the token's value. Token governance. Some tokens allow holders to vote on changes to the project or its tokenomics. This can be a powerful tool for community engagement and decision making. So these are the variables of tokenomics, I believe, is the most important variables of tokenomics that we could look at to determine if it is good. Now, first things first, they do have a total supply. To me, that's a good thing. I don't like tokens that don't have a total supply. So you can see right there, they have a total supply of 10 billion. 10 billion tokens right there, Arbitrum. It won't be any more ever in existence. Now, if you look at the circulating supply, we have 1.275 billion, as you can see right there. Um, and that's how many are actually circulating. Now, the initial token allocation and airdrop distribution, this is essentially how it was split up. Now, I have an actual visual of this, but 42.78% was given to the Arbitrum DAO treasury. That's pretty common. So there's a decentralized autonomous organization treasury. They control it, but this is voted on the community of people that have Arbitrum tokens. So it's essentially given to the community. That's the best way I can explain it. Now, off-chain labs and future team advisors gets 26.94%. That's pretty normal. Nothing out of the ordinary. Off-chain labs are the ones that created the entire token and everything. So you know, that's how it goes. Off-chain labs investors get 17.53. So we're looking at what? 26%, 27% plus 18%, 17.5% is kind of centralized given to the team advisors and investors. These people will probably sell to pay things off and things of that nature. It's a lot of supply, but it's nothing out of the ordinary and it's below 50%. So that's important. Now, they actually did a big major airdrop to launch Arbitrum. 
which was 11.62%. 11.62% was actually given to a whole bunch of people, um, you know, as an airdrop if you use the actual platform before. So in a test net. So they, they gave it out to everybody. That's decentralized. 1.13 is given out to DAOs building apps, uh, 113 million. Um, and yeah, this is basically just to build up the ecosystem and things of that nature. Now they don't have a burn rate. They don't, they don't do that. Um, when figuring out utility, it's good to understand how it all works. We talked about it before. Um, but really what I want to talk about is on-chain dispute resolution. This is where the managers come into play. So remember, this is a compression technology. They have off-chain execution where developers deploy smart contract code on Arbitrum as a virtual machine. Parties who want to use the contract appoint managers to oversee its execution. So they appoint managers to make sure that there's no malicious actors um, when using the off-chain executed code. Managers replicate the VM off-chain and agree on its state of updates, typically unanimous consensus. Only minimal data like VM state hash get posted to Ethereum. So essentially they do all the, the computations off chain and then there's managers that oversee it. Now, if a manager disagree, this is where the on-chain dispute resolution comes into play. If managers disagree on a virtual machine state, a bisection protocol can be used to resolve disputes on chain. One manager makes an assertion, another challenges, they bisect and dispute execution step by step. This continues until the execution of a single instruction is disputed. The manager in the wrong loses their deposit. That's important because what happens is they'll likely make the, the actual stake. So the amount they put up to dispute larger than the amount they're disputing. Let's say hypothetically someone sends a hundred bucks. They say that it's wrong. They'll likely have to bet 200 bucks that it's that you know they would they would go to the manager and they would dispute on an amount that's bigger than actually being sent so that when they get their deposit slashed they don't make money still hopefully that makes sense on-chain dispute resolution ensures correct vm execution with minimal verifier overhead so yeah this basically secures the network so a lot of arbitrum tokens are being used to do that so right here when making an assertion managers must lock up arb tokens as a deposit this is taking arb tokens off the market Challengers also have to deposit tokens when distributing an assertion. So this takes more off the market. This is taking more circulating supply off the market. Deposit amounts are configurable per virtual machine and act as a financial incentives for honest off-chain execution. So there's money allocated uh, to secure these uh, off-chain uh, virtual machine states. Um, dispute resolution. During on-chain bisection protocol, the managers continue to deposit more ARB tokens with each move. At the end, the losing manager deposits is slashed and awarded to the winner and Arbitrium verifiers. Dishonest managers have their token slashed, compensating honest parties for dispute resolution. We talked about this, right? So this increases the security. Now there's demand from other areas. So you get demand from the managers, right? We just talked about this staking tokens as its deposits. You get demand from the verifiers or the miners. This is a proof of stake consensus mechanism. I'm not going to go too much into how that works, but essentially there's people that verify the entire blockchain, entire state of the blockchain. These are the miners, and this is similar to Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. They actually you know, hold Arbitrum tokens to do that. So there's demand from that. There's demand from the governance. So if you want to participate in a decentralized autonomous organization by making votes, you have to you know, essentially use Arbitrum tokens to do that. So there's demand from that. There's demand from speculation of people like me and you that are trying to make money. Um, and there, these, are, these two demands are actually not from Arbitrum, but they're there just for information stake. Now we have to talk about the consensus mechanism. It's basically the same as Ethereum because it's agnostic to the underlying consensus model. It's a compression technology. The consensus nodes miners are verifiers that validate transactions and post data on the chain. Verifiers actively resolve disputes. Regular nodes passively maintain the virtual machine state. Verifiers enable dispute resolution without excessive overhead for other nodes. We talked about this. I just wanted to go over it again for the sake of professionalism in this video. Now, decentralization. Our Beatrum was actually created by Offchain Labs, a VC-backed company. The core protocol development is driven by this single corporate entity. So it was a private company for years, and they weren't launching any coin or nothing. They were just making technology. I actually talked about them in the past, and they launched um, a, a token. That's essentially the it's it's pretty that's pretty centralized in that perspective. But they did do an airdrop, and they have a minority of the tokens. So it's pretty normal compared to others. 
However, Arbitrium is an open source software and a team aims to eventually transition into community governments which they kind of have right now with the decentralized autonomous organization. Let's look at the token distribution at the bottom. The ARB token distribution seems somewhat centralized with the team holding a significant portion. However, the token is available for trading on major exchanges, so the circulating supply is dispersing. The impact of the initial distribution diminishes over time as the to token becomes more widely held. Also, I want to talk about something when it comes to the actual token usage. They can't, they can't actually use it right now. It's actually locked up. This is one of the biggest reasons why I think it's going to be one of the best tokens of 2023. While the user and DAO airdrops were available at the start of the token distribution on 3 2023, all investor and team tokens are subject to four year lockups. Now, listen to this with the first unlocks happening one year after the token generation event, which was 3 16 2023. This is very, very big. March 16th. 2024 will be the first time these guys are allowed to unlock their tokens. So that's literally around the Bitcoin halving event. So right now, a major portion of the supply, we're talking about 40, 50% of the supply cannot be touched and is not moving. It's not touched and not moving. This is very big. Please pay attention to what I'm saying right now. Vesting and lockup periods. I'm gonna read it again. With the first unlocks happening one year after the token generation event. So one year after this period is March 16th, 2024. Then monthly unlocks remain for the remaining three years. So the first year, a majority of the supply, a big majority of supply cannot be touched. This allows for price appreciation unlike no other. It's going to be really good for the price appreciation. You don't see a lot of tokens like that. So literally, I want you guys to look at it right here, like straight up. As you can see, the purple here, advisors, team, off-chain labs, right? Right here. They cannot touch this. So 32.52% is not being moved as well as the 21.16%. So we're talking about a majority is not being touched. This is not being touched. That's, that's pretty big, guys. That's really, really big. That's really big for price appreciation. Here's the holders on RB scan. Nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing out of the ordinary. Pretty straightforward. I mean, we've seen this before. Uh, the majority of it's held by the Dow Treasury. Um, vesting schedule. This is what it looks like after the first year. So for right now, we're good. We don't have to worry about them dumping on the market. Um, they don't have an emission schedule. Uh, if we come over here, here's an actual screenshot of the Dow Treasury. I just wanted to show you guys a little bit deeper, right? Now, let's jump into the team. Now, the team is really important. Why? Because the team really shows you the credibility behind them, the connections, the the actual, you know, um, the skill that they have, the professionalism. Are they actually good at what they do? And I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm going to say it straight up uh, before we even like jump into it. They have a world-class team. And I, I analyze not only the people from off chain labs, but I also analyzed the, you know, actual decentralized autonomous organization, people that are actually, you know, public, they have crazy experience. We're talking about professor of computer science and public affairs at Princeton university, former deputy U S chief technology officer in Obama white house. I mean, the, what the heck blockchain experience co-designed our beach protocol. I mean, authored early academic papers. I, this, this is, I mean, you can read it for yourself. There's, there's like not really too much higher credibility you can get. This guy has a PhD in computer science. I mean, highest of the high credibility. Now, if we look at Steven here, we have another PhD. I mean, previously a researcher at Microsoft Research focused on cryptography and blockchain technology, undergraduate degree of math and computer science from the University of Pennsylvania co-designed Core Arbitrium and leads its engineering as a CTO of Offchain Labs, previously worked on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency projects at Microsoft Research. I mean, big, big stuff. Uh, PhD, big, 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 big uh, credibility, guys. You guys can read the entire thing for yourself. It's all there for you. But I mean, we have another PhD here. Um, I mean, there's just big, 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 big credibility. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but this is the top of the line. Now, if we look at the decentralized autonomous organization directors, uh, we have, again, just crazy credibility. Uh, so uh, founder of Silverside, 
uh, experience over 30 years in the financial services industry in the Cayman Islands. Uh, relevant experience, 11 years at, as a VP at Goldman Sachs, now focuses on corporate governance for the Cayman Island entities. Big credibility. Uh, Citigroup, uh, Cheyenne Capital, BlackRock, right? BlackRock. This guy had HR leadership roles at Dell, Yahoo, AOL. I mean, we're talking about big stuff here. Experienced financial leader and Web3 advocate. We have Web3 specific type of information. Director at Malfire, focused on providing fiduciary and consulting services to funds and decentralized autonomous organizations. So this is, they're actually kind of like a company that works with DAOs um, and he is a part of it. So yeah, big time, big time, big time credibility. The team is outstanding. Investors, Pantera Capital, Coinbase Ventures, Mark Cuban. Come on guys, like at Alameda Research, Electric Capital. I mean, these names are huge, Sequoia Capital. These names are huge, guys, huge. I know, I know some of them went bankrupt with the whole FTX exchange debacle, but like, the, like guys, this is big stuff here. <laughs> big, big credibility behind the Arbitrium ecosystem. Now let's look into the marketing very briefly, um, but they're already big, so the marketing is gonna be, I compared them. I compared them to uh, Polygon. Look at Polygon, 121K followers. Polygon has a bigger market cap than Arbitrium, like a way bigger market cap. And I want you to look at the liquidity, right? Look at the liquidity. Arbitrum has very, very similar liquidity. Now look at Cardano, look at 1.3 million followers and it has less liquidity, it has less liquidity. Polygon, uh, you see at the bottom there is number 11 by market cap size. Arbitrum is 35. So they have sim way better marketing than Polygon, way better marketing than Polygon. They have similar liquidity and they're literally 24 places behind Polygon. That doesn't, it's so crazy. That's what you call undervalued. Look at Cardano, Cardano's higher. And they have, they have better marketing and better liquidity than, than Cardano. This is big, this is big, right? Now let's go into the actual regulatory environment that's recently been going on. The SEC and the CFTC regulate crypto in the United States. So basically that's, that's what's happening right now. We have the CFTC and the SEC that are suing company after company. The CFTC is responsible for regulating commodities, which are raw materials that are bought and sold. These are not commodities, but they're, I, I guess, stepping in. The CFTC has jurisdiction over some cryptocurrency derivatives, which are financial products that are based on cryptocurrencies. This includes future contracts, which are agreements to buy and sell cryptocurrency at a future date and options contracts, which give the buyer the right to buy and sell a cryptocurrency at a future date. The SEC and CFTC have taken different approaches to regulating cryptocurrencies. The SEC has taken more of a cautious approach, classifying some cryptocurrency as securities and bringing enforcement actions against companies that have violated securities laws. And the CFTC has taken more of a hands-off approach allowing some cryptocurrency derivatives to trade without registering with the CFTC. Yeah, and we all know what the SEC is doing right now. They're just suing everybody. So I would say it's more of a hands-on approach. Now, I'm just gonna read the titles of these, but most of them are just kind of efforts, effort by you know a specific country or an entity to regulate crypto. We have no guaranteed regulation, but I believe regulation is good no matter which way you cut it because they're decentralized protocols. They make things more efficient and the rich have already adopted it. So it doesn't really matter to me, but I do want to talk about it so that you guys can know what's going on. The first one is the European Union uh, crypto assets, MICA regulation. This came out. This was, I believe, a good framework for uh, consumer protection as well as a cryptocurrency market as a whole and innovation. So you guys can look into that for yourself or you can get the report in CoinPix Inner Circle. The future of crypto in China. I mean, Ch China has taken a very negative stance. They're probably the one of the countries that have taken the worst stance with cryptocurrency. They banned cryptocurrency trading in September, 2021. The People's Bank of China and countries and the country's central bank issued a statement prohibiting financial institutions and payment companies from providing services related to cryptocurrency transactions. They're like the worst. Japan actually had a comprehensive regulatory framework for cryptocurrency. Um, they're, they're more welcoming. They, they actually had more positive things to do when it comes to the cryptocurrency market. Singapore had a very light touch regulatory approach to cryptocurrencies. They, they left a lot of innovation in there and they're known as one of the better uh, regulatory environments. Um, India 
They proposed a cryptocurrency bill called the Cryptocurrency and Regulation of Official Digital Currency Bill of 2021, which would ban all private cryptocurrencies from the country. The bill is still in works, but it has raised concerns among the cryptocurrency investors. This is a bad cryptocurrency stance. What is a private crypto, right? What is a private crypto? No one really knows. Now, also, we all know that Binance is being investigated by SEC. Whether that turns out good or bad, again, I want to say, just be very clear, it doesn't really matter that much because what's going to happen is going to be short-term bad. Let's say it's a bad investigation. They sue Binance. It's over for them or whatever the case is. It'll be bad short-term and then long-term, it'll just have another entity that was swoop in. There's way too much money in this market. The whole thing that you guys have to understand about regulation is that they need cryptocurrencies to further the entire world agenda. They need cryptocurrencies to make a new world currency. There's no other technology in the world that's even close to what blockchain technology has done. There's no technology in the world. So right now, our financial systems are like archaic. They're like very, very old and bad and very inefficient. With cryptos, it actually gives them more control over the money. It gives them more control to see who, what's doing what, and to see who's doing what, and this, that, and the third. So again, all these, these enforcement actions and things like that, these big enforcement actions, it doesn't really matter. Um, in my personal opinion, I think they're just trying to make money and sue them, make a whole bunch of money and establish regulation at the same time. Now, this was Bank of England's warning on stable coins. That one's a big one. I think a lot of people should read into this video would be way too long. Maybe I'll make a separate video on that specifically. Now, let's look at the news. We, we talked about some news that recently came out, um, but this one was big in my opinion. They actually came out with a grants program. So essentially what they're doing is they're giving out money to fund the Arbitrum ecosystem. They're developing the, the Arbitrum ecosystem. They're funding projects that want to make DeFi better. I mean, they're, they're spending money to make this work, right? And this is not a lot, but this is phase one. So th this is like the planning phase, I guess you could say. Once they actually start building things, once they actually start building things, that's why I think the ball is going to roll and it's going to be very, very interesting. Um, they also came out with AIP 1.1 which is essentially an entire structured plan of what they're going to do. Uh, it's the lockup budget and transparency proposal uh, relating to the management of the actual treasury, which was locked up in a decentralized autonomous organization. You guys can read this for yourself, uh, but it outlines pretty much everything. And then they came out with 1.2. They made amendments to certain things. So this is like the big news about what they're going to do with the treasury. Now, if you want to see what they do with the proposals, you know, uh, what proposals are coming out. You can actually go to snapshot.org and you can see everything that they're actually doing with the decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, you can scroll down, you can look at which ones got canceled, which ones, you know, didn't get canceled. Proposal to onboard uh, matrix.link as a validator for Arbitrum C. They just added a new validator. Uh, you can come over here and look at closed, see the ones that actually look for, for, Security Console election proposed implementations. This is like the big news of what they did. So this is the Security Console. They're doing something for security. Um, update Security Console election start date, right? Accelerating, accelerating Arbitrum leveraging. Okay, this one was against. Four, fund the Arbitrum grants framework. So this is the one I was talking about. This is the important one in my personal opinion because it's actually, it's contributing to the ecosystem and funding projects. That's That's how you make money, right? That's how the price goes up for this to actually do well. Uh, so that's the one I thought that was important for price increase. So that's pretty much it for this video. The next video is gonna be the actual 100X altcoin. I've gone over so much, guys. I've gone over so much. If you made it this far, make sure to subscribe to the channel, turn on the post notification bell. I mean, I made two separate videos about the trend of the market. Then I actually made an entire video about where the liqu liquidity is gonna go. And I did fundamental analysis on the layer in which the coin is going to be. Next video, we're actually gonna talk about the 100X altcoin. This is an entire video series. I'll leave it in the pinned comment below. Check out the entire video series if you're new here. That's pretty much it for this video, guys. Thanks for watching. I love you guys. If you like the quality of this content, hit like. If you don't, leave some constructive criticism. Subscribe for more video updates. And like I always say, if you don't get with it, you will get left behind. Thanks for watching this video, guys. Catch you in the next one.